We want to welcome our visitors. We're glad that you're with us this morning and hope that you will stay for Bible class and hope that you will come back tonight because this sermon is going to have a sequel tonight. And we hope that you will come back to hear uh, the sequel of this sermon uh, tonight at 6 o'clock as we gather again together to worship God. You may have heard them talk about it on the television. You may have heard about it uh, in a sermon by some denominational pastor. You may have uh, seen or read a book about it. They say it will go something like this, that people will be driving in their car and all of a sudden they will disappear. The car will careen off the road and crash. There will be pilots who are piloting planes then all of a sudden they'll disappear. And the plane will have no pilot. And that plane with the rest of the people that are on board will crash because it has no pilot. Wives will wake up to see, some wives will wake up to see their husband is gone. Their children are gone. Husbands will wake up and find that their family is gone. There'll be some graves that are open and the bodies have disappeared in the graveyard. The mausoleums, the, the areas where the dead are buried are kept, the crypts, some of them will be open and the bodies will be gone. And there will be people who are left behind, who are in chaos, who are wondering what, what's going on. And during that period of time, they, they, there will be all kinds of theories. Uh, some people will say, well, maybe alien abduction. Maybe aliens had something to do with this. Or it's some sort of interdimensional shift. You just have the theories going right and left. And it's made popular by books such as the one, as you see on the screen, Left Behind. It's based upon a theory in eschatology, which is known as premillennialism, the rapture, a secret snatching away when Christ returns, leaving people behind. People will be left behind, and they will be in chaos for about seven years until Jesus returns again. We'll see some tenets of this doctrine a little bit later on in our lesson. But this has been made popular by novels such as this one here, as you see on the screen, Left Behind, a novel of the earth's last days. They're almost as popular as the Twilight novels that are very popular today. In which these novels, they talk about the rapture that takes place and that people are left behind who weren't saved and they have to go through a period of time called the tribulation. And many people see that as truth. Many people think that that's exactly what the Bible teaches. They watch a movie, they hear a preacher preach it, or they read it in a novel and they take it as if it is actually what the Bible says. They even make movies about it. Here's a movie with uh, Kirk Cameron in it, Left Behind, the movie, in which he, stays, he is left behind because he's not part of the ones that are raptured. And he documents all of the chaos that goes on when this rapture takes place. There's one point where he's on a, a plane and, and, and all of a sudden some people just disappear and he looks around and there's this man, this woman asking where her husband is and he, she says to him, Kirk Cameron, well, he was sitting right here and the camera pans down and there's an empty suit. He was just raptured right out of his clothes. So I guess you leave your clothes behind in the rapture theory. The rapture, being left behind. Why is this being taught? Why is this being put into movies? Why is this being written about in novels? Well, it's because of people like Hal Lindsey, who are <coughs> denominational preachers who, who write books like this, The Late Great Planet Earth. And in this book, he uh, makes very clear that we are in the last days. And they always talk about the last days being, it used to be the 20th century, but now we're in a new century. Now they say the 21st century is the last days of earth. And he believes this theory of premillennialism, in which we will see in just a moment. 
You can see him on television. He has the Hal Lindsey Report. It is a weekly half-hour news and commentary series hosted by the popular Bible prophecy teacher Hal Lindsey, author of the late great planet Earth. This informative program, it says, covers current events and national and international issues from a biblical and prophecy-based perspective. And what that means, if you ever watch him on television, anything that goes on in the Middle East, he thinks has something to do with Bible prophecy. Anything that has anything to do with the Jews, he believes that's based in Bible prophecy. Anything as far as an earthquake, that has to do with Bible prophecy. So everything in the news he finds Bible prophecy for. Why? He believes the theory of premillennialism. Premillennialism is a doctrine that is uh, uh, very popular within the denominational world, and it springs forth movies such as Left Behind, novels such as the Left Behind series, and is promoted by preachers like Hal Lindsey and other prophecy-based preachers on television and on the radio. It's very simple to understand. It's a big word, but it's very simple. Pre means before. Millennial means a thousand. Ism talks about the doctrine of. And it's the doctrine which says that Jesus is going to come back at the end of time and set up a thousand year reign upon the earth. And here are the basic elements of that doctrine. The kingdom is not here yet. It is yet to be established. They teach, and we'll, we'll elaborate on this a little bit later on, that when Jesus came to set up the kingdom, he was rejected and therefore could not set up the kingdom. Therefore, the kingdom is not here yet, they say. They say the kingdom will be a literal material kingdom. That it will be an empire just like the, in the days of Solomon, but even greater because they say it will extend throughout the world. And, of course, the base of it is Jerusalem in Israel. Christ will come back and reign on a literal throne in Jerusalem, they say. That Jesus is going to come back to this earth. He is going to sit on a literal throne in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem will be the headquarters of planet earth at that time. The Jews at this time will return to Palestine, they say. Those who hold to the premillennial doctrine believe that the the physical Jews today are still God's chosen people. That's why there is a lot of American policies that are pro-Israel. They still think that's God's chosen people and that Palestine is still the promised land and therefore a lot of policies are pro-Israeli policies and politics. It's based upon this doctrine of premillennialism. It also teaches there will be a thousand year reign on the earth. Thus the millennial concept. And they take that thousand years from a symbolic passage of Revelation chapter 20. In which it says Jesus will reign with them for a thousand years. But when you look at the context of Revelation chapter 20. There's no mention of the earth. None whatsoever in Revelation 20. And that is in the context of a very highly symbolic book. And we don't have time to deal with Revelation 20 in detail uh, uh, today. But that's where they get that concept of a thousand year reign. And they say it's going to take place on earth. During that time, they say that the earth is going to be refurbished. That it's going to be a paradise all over earth when Jesus is reigning from Jerusalem. Let me give you the basic premillennial theory in this timeline outline form. Uh, They say that Jesus came to set up this kingdom 2,000 years ago, but was rejected and therefore was killed. And he ascended back to heaven, and in the meantime, he established the church as a substitute. And so they teach that the church and the kingdom are two different institutions. Now, depending on which person you talk to, some will say, well, the church is a beginning stage or the first phase of the kingdom, but it's not the fullness of the kingdom. 
So it just depends on who you talk to as far as this premillennial theory. And there's a lot of people that have various shades and nuances to this theory. But most of them make it very clear the church and the kingdom are not the same institution. They say that when Jesus returns, there is going to be a rapture of people. There will be a resurrection and this will be invisible. You're not going to be able to see it. That's why the people left behind are going to be puzzled. Where is everybody? Where did they go? Were they abducted by aliens? What happened? It's going to be invisible. There will be a resurrection and those who are alive when this rapture takes place, they say, will just disappear. And then people will be left behind. They will go to heaven for a period of about seven years where they, when, where they will receive a judgment. They will be judged for what they have done. On earth, this is going to cause chaos. A tribulation. Problems on earth for about seven years. Seven year tribulation. That's why the Left Behind series says uh, they're left behind and they're chaotic and, and people are puzzled. What's going on? They say during this time is when the Antichrist will rise. He will rise and rule over the earth and deceive so many people. After the end of about seven years, Christ is going to return again with those he raptured. He's going to return with them now to earth and he is going to fight literally in the battle of Armageddon. Jesus is going to engage in, in literal warfare with the enemies of the Antichrist and physically defeat them with the saints that are with him. When the Antichrist is finally defeated, then he will set up the kingdom from Jerusalem and reign for a thousand years. There will be another resurrection, by the way, when Jesus returns. So that's the first one. There's the second one. Then there's going to be that thousand year reign upon the earth. The millennial reign in which the, the, the earth will be refurbished. It will be perfect. Christ will be reigning for a thousand years. Then at the end of that, there's going to be another resurrection. And then the final judgment. And after the final judgment, again, depending on who you're talking to, either, either the earth will continue forever or the earth will be destroyed and people will go to heaven or hell. Now this is a nutshell of what they teach. And they quote a lot of Bible verses when they do it. And that's why it's so convincing to people because they quote a lot of verses. But you know the devil quotes verses? When the devil was tempting Jesus, you remember in his third temptation, did he not quote a Bible verse? The devil knows how to quote verses. And just because a lot of verses are quoted doesn't make something true. Uh, verses can be mishandled. The word of truth can be handled incorrectly. Verses can be taken out of context. Symbolic verses can be made literal when they're never meant to be made literal. And therefore, error can be taught. Friends, this is false teaching. This is not what the Bible teaches. Not at all. If it were not for the movies and the novels and the theologians and the preachers on TV, you would not come up with this concept just simply reading the Bible. You're not going to come up with that. Nowhere in the Bible would you find such a wild theory. Let's see what the Bible actually says. Let's look at the biblical teaching of the kingdom and the return of Christ. What does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches Jesus came, He was rejected, and He died, and God knew that was going to happen. It was predicted. Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, uh, other passages predict the death of the Messiah, His suffering on the cross. God knew that was going to happen. Jesus knew that was going to happen. He came to earth to die. And therefore, after His death... His burial, His resurrection, He ascended back to the Father. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And when He did, He set up His kingdom, starting in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 2. This is something that's very essential to remember. The church is the kingdom, according to the Bible. The church and the kingdom are the very same institu institution. Like calling Jesus Lord and calling Jesus Christ. He is the same person. 
whether he's referred to as Christ or Lord. Same way with the church. The church and the kingdom are the same institution. So in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, when that power came upon the apostles and they preached the gospel, when 3,000 obeyed, the church kingdom was established. In John 18 and verse 36, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. That's a very clear passage saying that my kingdom is not the kind of kingdom that you see around you. It's not of this world. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, my followers would fight that I should not be delivered into your hands. But my kingdom is not of this world. He's making it very clear that it's spiritual. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19, when he said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Peter was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven and Jesus refers to the church as the kingdom of heaven in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19. Now think about this. If Peter and the apostles were given the keys of the kingdom and the kingdom was not in place and established in their lifetime, they never had a chance to use those keys. What are keys used to do? Open up, to give access to. Did Peter use the keys of the kingdom that the other apostles did? Yes, in Acts chapter 2, when they were told to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when they did that, they were added to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. Those keys were used to gain access to the kingdom, which is the church. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14 He has translated us out of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. So where we find redemption and forgiveness of sins is in the kingdom. So when a person is converted, when they're baptized into Christ, they become a citizen of the kingdom. Acts 20 and verse 25, and you find this all throughout the book of Acts, they were preaching the kingdom. Before the cross, what did John preach? The kingdom is at hand. What did Jesus preach? The kingdom is at hand. It's close. It's coming. After the cross and after Acts chapter 2, they preached the kingdom. No longer did they say it's coming. Why? It already came. They were preaching the kingdom. In Revelation 1 and verse 9, John says, I am your brother in the kingdom. John believed he was in the kingdom. He said, I'm your brother in the kingdom. So the church is the kingdom. And we know this by prophecy. I want you to look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. There's many passages in the book of Daniel that deal with the the kingdom and the establishment of the kingdom. And by the way, you got a homework assignment for tonight. Read Daniel chapter 2. Read Daniel chapter 2 for tonight because that is going to be a follow-up lesson tonight for the sermon that you're hearing right now. Daniel 7 and verse 22, in the context here of all this imagery, what he is saying here is that in the time of the Roman Empire, God is going to have a kingdom and there are going to be those who possess that kingdom. Daniel 7 and verse 22 says, look at verse 21, uh, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and was prevailing against them. That's talking about the Roman Empire persecuting the church. He was killing the church, the Roman uh, emperors were. Verse 22. Until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. The saints possess the kingdom. In the context there, that's in the days of the Roman Empire. Now I'll prove that tonight in Daniel chapter 2. Now look at verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all His dominion shall serve and obey Him. Shall be given to the saints. The kingdom shall be given to the saints. All throughout the New Testament, Christians are called saints. 
all throughout the New Testament, Christians are called saints. In fact, they're called saints more than they're called Christians. The word Christian is only found three times in the New Testament. The word saint is found numerous times. So a saint is one who has the kingdom. Well, they had the kingdom. Therefore, the kingdom existed from the day of Pentecost when Jesus ascended back to heaven and the church was established in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2. We live during this period of time right here. We're in the kingdom right now. But one day, Jesus is going to return. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28 says, Christ is returning a second time apart from sin for salvation. Jesus is not coming back to earth to die. He already died. His sacrifice was sufficient. In fact, Jesus is coming back to earth, but He will never set foot on earth, according to the Bible. He will never set foot on earth again. And when He comes, there will be a resurrection of the dead, and there will be one resurrection of the just and the unjust. Acts chapter 24 and verse 15. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, He said, Don't marvel at this. The hour is coming when all that are in their graves shall hear His voice and come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation. One resurrection. Premillennialism has at least three resurrections. Separated by years. That's not what the Bible teaches. One resurrection in which all that are in their graves shall come forth. So we see that the resurrection will be a general one-time event. All humanity will be resurrected. Then there will be judgment. God will call all humanity into judgment. Romans 14 verses 10 through 12. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 6 through 12. 10 talks about Christ returning. He's coming with His holy angels in flaming fire to take out vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel and to bring the saints into glory as well. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27, it makes it very clear, makes it very clear that when Christ returns, He is going to reward every person according to their works or according to their deeds. And then, of course, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 14, talks about that great day of judgment in which we are brought before Him. Every person is judged according to what they've done in their body, whether good or evil. Again, only one judgment. There's at least two or three judgments in premillennial doctrine. But according to the Bible, one return, one resurrection, and one judgment day. Then the earth will be destroyed. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 12 makes it very clear. This current material universe that we're living in right now will be destroyed with fervent heat. It will melt with fervent heat and will be destroyed. The righteous will go to heaven, which is sometimes called the new heaven and the new earth. The saved will be in heaven, and then the lost will go to hell or the lake of fire, everlasting punishment. That's a far cry from premillennialism. This right here, this return of Christ, is a one-time event. Not separated by seven years or a thousand years. One-time event when Jesus returns. So what's going to happen as far as life before that event? Everything will go on as normal. But, but won't there be signs? Won't there be a uh, uh, thing? No. Not according to the Bible. Life will go on as normal. Then Jesus will return. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24 makes it very clear. Then comes the end. In the context there, he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. Then comes the end. When He delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when He puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. Notice what's going to happen when Jesus returns and the resurrection takes place. The kingdom is going to be delivered to God the Father. It's not going to be established. It's already here. It was established 2,000 years ago in Acts chapter 2. 
the kingdom, which is the church, is going to be delivered to God the Father. Therefore, we see when the end comes, then that's going to be the end of the world. Of course, we, we recognize from 2 Peter chapter 3. And the kingdom will be taken to God the Father. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. I mean, but won't we know? Aren't there going to be signs? And that's what they say throughout premillennial documents. There's going to be signs. There's going to be countdowns. There's going to be uh, these things. And they confuse what's going on in Matthew chapter 24 with the signs leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem with the signs of the end of the world. Those things are not to be mixed up. And they confuse people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 through 4 makes it very clear. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. When a thief breaks into your house or steals from your car... They don't give any signs or any indication. You don't know when that's going to happen. And that's how Christ is going to return. It's going to happen. It's just going to happen. No countdown to it. No signs will accompany it beforehand. It will be something that is even unexpected. Look at Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 through 44. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. Notice this. You also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. That's powerful right there. He's coming at an hour that you do not expect. So when people say in in the year 2012, that's going to be the year. Even make a movie about the destruction of the world in 2012 based on some Mayan calendar that runs out in 2012. That's silly. At an hour you don't expect, not when you're expecting it, when you don't expect. That's when the Son of Man is coming. So the point is, you live your life as you should always and you're always ready doesn't matter when he comes. He's going to come like a thief. He's going to come unexpected. You be ready. That's what he says. You therefore also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Life will go on as normal. Jesus is returning. And I want you to look at 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4 as we wrap up this lesson. Remember tonight, Daniel chapter 2. We're going to be looking at that chapter and look at that prophecy. So read that before tonight's sermon. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 and 2 Thessalonians have a lot to say about the return of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 15. Paul says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Talking about those who have died. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout. See, nothing quiet about it. The heavens and the earth will pass away with a great noise. Peter tells us nothing quiet about the return of Christ. It's going to be the loudest event in human history. The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. See, Jesus is not going to set foot on earth. We're going to meet Him in the air. And notice what it says... We will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord, not in Jerusalem, to reign for a thousand years, in the air. And so we will ever be with the Lord. Jesus is returning. 
at any moment. It could be in the next 20 minutes. It could be in the next 2,000 years. We don't know. And I want you to notice these words as we think about this practically. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 and verse 18. Chapter 4 and verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Does the thought of Jesus Christ coming today or at any, at any moment comfort you or scare you? If it scares you, that says something about your relationship with God. If it comforts you, that says something about your relationship with God. Because we are comforted in the fact, if we're faithful Christians, that Jesus could come at any moment. And so we have the attitude, come, Lord Jesus, we're ready. But if you're terrified of the thought of Jesus returning at any moment, that means you're not right. You're not right with God. And it's too late to try to get yourself right with God after He returns. That's when it'll be over with. The period of grace will end. The long-suffering of God is happening right now. The very fact that Jesus has not returned to this very moment is an indication of His long-suffering. And His willingness that not any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if you're not right with the Lord, we urge you to do so. If you need to obey the gospel, believe in Jesus Christ with all your heart. Make the great confession He is the Son of God. Repent of your sins and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. And the Lord will cleanse you, sanctify you, wash you clean, and add you to His kingdom. John 3 and verse 5, you're born of water and the Spirit to enter into the kingdom. If you've done that and you've gone astray, again... The thought of Jesus Christ returning at any moment should terrify you because you're not ready. Repent and come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and sing.